Yes, Ms. Orr. Our next witness is Mr. Robert Johansson, Commissioner. Mr. Johansson, do you mind just remaining standing a moment while I first ask whether you'd prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? I'll take an oath. Yes, swear the witness, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Batt. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Johansson, your full name is Robert Niven Johansson. It is. And your business address is the Bendigo Centre, 22 to 42 Bath Lane, Bendigo, Victoria. Yes. Uh, and you are the chairman of the board of directors of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank Limited. I am. Uh, do you attend to give evidence pursuant to a summons issued by the Commissioner day to date November this year? Yes. Uh, you have the original of the summons with you, Mr. Johansson? Yeah. Uh, I attended that, Commissioner. Exhibit 7.140, the summons to Mr Johansson. Now, Mr Johansson, you've prepared, have you, a witness statement dated 7 November 2018 in response to questions directed to the bank under rubric 705 issued by the Commission? Yes. And do you have the signed original witness statement and its exhibits with you? I do. Could you just briefly, please, turn on page 9 of your statement to paragraph 40 Uh, if you have that before you, is it right that you wish to delete the words at the start of that paragraph which read, as set out in section 7.1 of the remuneration policy, uh, on the basis that that cross-reference is not entirely applicable? I do. Uh, if you have a pen, could you then please uh, take it out and strike out the words I read and initial that deletion? Uh, with that change having been made, Mr Johansson, are the contents of your witness statement true and correct? They are. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I tender the statement with its exhibits. The statement of Mr Johansson and exhibits in relation to rubric 7-05 becomes exhibit 7.141. Nothing further to the Commissioner, Thank you, please. Mr Batt. Yes, is all. Uh, Mr Johansson, you've been a non-executive director of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank for 30 years. I have. Uh, and you've been the chairman of the board for the last 12 years. Yes. And you plan to retire from the board when your term ends next year? I do. And in your 30 years as a director, what are the major changes that you've seen in the financial services industry? <coughs> I hope there's a limit to the time we're going to sit here. <laughs> Yes, yeah, well, it, it, an enormous amount has changed. Uh, when I started, the organisation was a very small country building society um, uh, with, with uh, dis distribution presence really only in central Victoria. Um, soon after came the pyramid crisis, which uh, some people in the room may remember. Um, but out of that, uh, Bendigo Building Society, which was uh, effectively uh, uh, took over a lot of other building societies which were in great difficulty. Um, and in the 90s, there, there came a process of, uh, of rationalisation, of expansion, um, uh, following, in a sense, the, the freeing up of the financial system that was unleashed by... Uh, the Hawke government um, in the early early 80s. Um, and in, in a way, the pyramid crisis was as in part a consequence of that. So we've seen th that cycle. Um, uh, our organisation then expanded through um, acquisition and merger um, and through growth. Um, and we, we expanded in, in substantial part because we then started to partner with local communities to provide banking services to places that felt that they were missing out on them as things were tending to centralise. Um, the next big event was, I suppose, the uh, global financial crisis. Um, and what happened... Uh, so we, we, by that stage, were a, a bank. Uh, Bendigo was a very retail-focused, retail-driven, uh, deposit-funded organisation, um, and we were missing out on a whole part of the business, which was the wholesale end of the business. 
Um, and so we merged with Adelaide Bank, which was a much strong, stronger in those parts of the business. Um, now, the consequences of the collapse in credit and funding through the global financial crisis meant that uh, a, lot of those, a lot of those parts of the business, in fact, became quite challenged. Um, uh, and, and indeed, the whole, the whole finance system became quite challenged. And uh, as a result of the global crisis, the collapse in available credit for Australian banks and interventions by government, such as guarantees of deposits, um, guarantees by governments of uh, bank wholesale borrowings, um, allowing a f even further consolidation to take place. So mortgage brokers, which had provided a disruptive competitive element in the industry mostly ended up getting bought by the major banks. Um, and, and the Another thing I meant, Rich and uh, Commissioner, is that uh, there has been a substantial change in the way banks are regulated as a result of what we call advanced accreditation. So large, sophisticated banks, um, and this was part of the kind of deregulatory zeal, if you like, of the 1990s, um, part, large sophisticated banks that could convince the regulator they had the systems to cope with this were basically able to set their own capital requirements. Um, so risk weight, in particular risk weightings for particular classes of assets, the banks could themselves uh, set. So we saw in, as a result of the global crisis, uh, central banks and governments effectively flooding the finance system with cheap money. Um, and in Australia, while we'd avoided the problems, the credit problems of the global financial crisis, um, uh, th there were lots of concerns. Um, and so uh, a lot of that funding was pushed into the domestic centre, the dom domestic area of the economy. And so housing, for example, um, became a way that we were going to uh, continue to, to, to keep economic activity up despite the, uh, the, the crisis. Um, and so the major banks uh, now with the benefit of their um, um, expanded business spaces, the mortgage brokers, the other banks that had got into problems, um, as a result of the funding that was available to them through the, um, th through the support mechanisms, invested hugely uh, into this domestic area. And of course, they were relative, to say unconstrained would be uh, too much, but they were free to, um, or they were relatively free to set their own risk limits in those things. And so we've seen the expansion of domestic credit. So, um, in Australia, we now have, from our perspective, we basically have a two-tier banking system. Uh, we have uh, a group for major banks that dominate the market, um, have the benefit of that advanced accreditation system that I described, even though the regulator has pulled back on the extremes of, of, the, of the implications of that major banks that still have the benefit of the implied government guarantee on wholesale borrowings. Um, and then you have a, a large, a large number, but over the years, relatively stable number of smaller players who try to pro provide alternatives and find a place in that finance system. Is that enough? Thank you. Uh, in the submissions that Bendigo and Adelaide Bank provided to the Commission following the interim report, uh, the bank expressed the view that many of the issues identified in the interim report reflected a departure from the simple notion that banks perform a fundamental service to society which should benefit all parties. And could you just explain a bit more about that simple, what you have described as that simple notion? So, um, uh, Bendigo, uh, Bendigo Bank is 160 years old this year uh, and uh, 
I, we had an, a celebration held just over the road from where the first meeting, foundation meeting, was held. So it was founded by a group of 100 people who came together. This was not long after um, Europeans arrived in central Victoria to dig gold. They said they were sick of living in tents and they agreed to pool their resources, pledged a certain amount of money on a regular basis and they take it in turns to build houses. Um, that's, that's the genesis of our company and in a way that's still the foundation of it. We serve, we, we're there to help our customers and stakeholders get access to credit, provide sources for ways for them to safely save uh, to improve their material prosperity through access to a finance system. Mm. If they improve their prosperity, then their communities will prosper. If they and their communities prosper, so will we. But it's in that order. Mm. And that's reflected in a statement in those submissions that Bendigo provided that the role of a bank is to feed into community prosperity, not off it. You, don't have, you won't have a prosperous bank if you have an impoverished community. Mm -hmm. your, your submissions contained a list of 10 things that Bendigo believes the community expects it to strive for. And they were to act honestly and fairly, to listen to customers and respond to their needs, to act for the long-term benefit of the community, to promote financial inclusion, to securely hold customers' money and personal information, to derive a fair return on the shareholder capital provided by the community, to pay a fair share of profit in tax, to operate within the law, to ensure staff are fairly rewarded and to provide staff with a safe workplace, free of harassment, discrimination and bullying. Now, these all sound like attractive and somewhat obvious propositions, Mr Johansson, why do you think so many banks have had so much difficulty conducting their operations in a way that is consistent with many of those propositions? Um, well, I'm reluctant to uh, uh, start to disparage other members of the industry that I'm, that I'm proud to be part of. Um, but in my uh, story of the history of, uh, of you know, the big events in the last 30 years or whatever it was, um, I think you can see that, uh, and you know, where do you want to go back to, but, but if you go back to the, what we did as a result of the global financial crisis, um, I think what I was trying to say was that banks um, became almost the vehicle through which we were to keep the economy humming. Uh, uh, and uh, banks were rewarded and applauded for getting on with the business of getting credit out there, keeping investment going. Um, banks became um, an astonishingly large proportion of the stock exchange, for example. And it's still the case that I think it's almost a third of dividends come from the major, from the banking system. Um, so, and if you'd suggested uh, nine years ago that oh, we needed to ensure that our regulator was properly funded uh, to crack down on practices uh, in, in fin the finance system, um, people would have said, what are you trying to do? And indeed, funding was cut from them. So I think, I think that um, it, it's not just the banks or the people who are running the banks that we need to reflect on when we think where we go to from here. But in our case, um, you know, we, 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 we weren't part of that, what from my perspective would seem to be a kind of uh, favoured group of players in the market. Uh, we'd been through a very difficult experience of affecting the merger, um, confronting the implications of the global crisis, uh, getting through all that, dealing with lots of problems that emerged as part of that. 
uh, and we had a new chief executive. And for us, it was a good chance to stop, sit back, think, reset, and think what a sustainable position for us was in that new marketplace. Uh, the submissions that Bendigo provided the Commission suggest that the way that banks have structured their remuneration arrangements has been a major cause of some of the problems that we've seen in the Commission this year. Is that your position, Mr Johansson? Uh, we said, well, um, again, I'm reluctant to prescribe for others what they're what's appropriate for them. But we've certainly taken a quite different approach to remuneration. That, that's what I'd like to talk to you about, Mr Johans. And I want to ask you about the remuneration arrangements at your bank, um, both at the executive and at the frontline level, uh, and how they differ from what we've seen from some of the other arrangements we've looked at over the course of this fortnight. And I want to start with how you remunerate your executives in your bank. and. Um, for the moment, I want to focus my questions on the remuneration model that you have for your managing director, your CEO, uh, the chief financial officer, the chief risk officer and the chief people officer. Now, in broad terms, the model that you use for those people has three components, base remuneration, a short-term incentive component and a long-term incentive component. Yes. And over the last two weeks, we've heard that a number of other banks defer part of the short-term component of their executive's variable remuneration, and all of the long-term component is deferred. Yes. Have you heard that evidence, yes. Mr Johansson? Um, but Bendigo does more than that. Bendigo also defers part of its executive's base fixed remuneration. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So they receive part of their base salary uh, in cash, paid immediately, and another part in shares, which are held on trust for a period of time? Yes. And do those shares vest automatically at the end of the deferral period? No, there's always the discretion that uh, for the board um, that if things emerge in that period of deferral, as it were, that they can be recovered. And why does Bendigo Bank defer part of its executives' base remuneration? What, what do you see as the advantages of that different approach? Well, we think it's better to have a large proportion of the total package in the form of base. Um, but uh, as, as you say, we pay part of that base in the form of shares. So it's, as shareholders often tell me, they like to see executives and directors with skin in the game. So it gives them skin in the game. Um, but where, because of the deferral process, it sets, if, if, if they're interested and in, if it alters their perspective on things, it's saying you're not going to get them for some years out. So that's the time frame you need to be thinking about. Do you know of any other banks that defer part of their executives' base salary? No. And are there any disadvantages that you see flowing from your system of deferring part of the base salary? It's worked very well for us. Mm. So I, I want to ask you in a bit more detail about um, what Bendigo does with each of the three components of executive remuneration, uh, base remuneration, short-term incentives and long-term incentives. I want to start with that base. Um, now, in particular, what I want to ask you about is the balance between base remuneration and variable remuneration. And you say in your statement that your bank has historically weighted its executive remuneration not towards variable remuneration, but towards the base pay, the fixed pay. Is that right? It is. That's right. And can I um, take you first to a table in your statement that shows us how that works for some of the key people in your organisation? Um, if we go to your statement, which is BAB 9000000003001, and we turn to paragraph 14 at 0005, we see in the table underneath paragraph 14 the target remuneration mix uh, for each relevant executive committee member for the 2018 financial year. 
Um, and we see that in this target mix, the fixed base for the managing director is 40 per cent. Yes. And the deferred base for the managing director is 25 per cent. So yeah. there's a total of 65 per cent base remuneration. Yes. Of course, the, va the value of the deferred base yes. in the form of shares can go up and down. Yes. And in this target mix for your managing director, only 10% is a short-term incentive. Yes. And the remaining 25% of the target mix is a long-term incentive. Yes. And for your chief financial officer, the target mix is 50% fixed base, 10% deferred base, so a 60% base remuneration for that role. Is that right? Yes. And 20% short-term incentive? Yes. And for your chief risk officer, the target mix is 60% fixed base, 10% deferred base, so 70% base remuneration. Yes. And only 10% can comprise a short-term incentive. Yes. Now, how does that target remuneration mix compare to the other banks? Well, I understand others have a much larger share of or well, proportion of the of the income, or at least the potential income of the, the, these executives in these positions in the form of, of what they call short-term incentive. Mm. Well, taking CBA as an example, base remuneration appears to be around 25% of the total target remuneration mix for the CEO. Yeah. Uh, and I, I see from your statement that the bank has done some of its own benchmarking of its executive remuneration against your peers. If we could turn to Exhibit 9 to your statement, which is BAB 5037 Yes. We see when this comes up on the screen, and you have it there in front of you, Mr Johansson, um, that this is a submission from, from the People and Performance Unit within the bank uh, to the Governance and HR Committee from July this year. Yes. And if we turn to 1888, we see that it attached the result of a benchmarking exercise undertaken by the bank comparing the remuneration of your Chief Financial Officer and your Chief Customer Officer against equivalent roles at other banks and institutions. Yes. And we can see that for your Chief Financial Officer, the maximum short-term incentive opportunity and long-term incentive opportunity were both 32% of that person's fixed remuneration. Yes. And we can see that for each of that person's peers listed here, including NAB and ANZ and Suncorp, the percentage was far higher. Yes. None of the CEOs at the other banks listed here had a short-term remuneration opportunity that was lower than 100% of their fixed remuneration. CFOs, I think. I'm sorry, did I say CEO? I think CFO, so. I apologise. Yes. So none of them were um, less than 100% of the fixed remuneration. And NAB's CFO, uh, that person's short-term remuneration opportunity was the highest. That was fixed at 175% of their fixed remuneration. Yes. So very considerable differences uh, between the way that you reward your chief financial officer and the way that these entities reward their chief financial officer. Yes. And we see a similar comparison for the Chief Customer Officer, who at that time was um, Ms Baker, now your CEO. Her maximum short-term incentive opportunity was 29% of her fixed remuneration. Yes. Do you see that? Yes. And her maximum long-term incentive opportunity was 32%. Yes. While her peers at the other banks listed there all had a short-term remuneration opportunity of or uh, above 100% of their fixed remuneration. Yes. And NAB's chief customer officer, again, in this list of peers, had the highest short-term remuneration opportunity at 175% of yes. 
of their fixed remuneration. Yes. So having said all of that out, Mr Johansson, why? Why does Bendigo and Adelaide Bank have such a low proportion of short-term variable remuneration for its executives? Um, we believe we're trying to build a business for the long term. We're trying to uh, establish a strategic position um, to be the bank of choice for Australians. Uh, th that's a articulation of it that's come with the new managing director. We used to say we wanted to be the most customer-centred uh, bank in, in the country. Um, and we feel that to build long-term relationships with customers, um, so that's, that's a relationship that uh, in, hopefully will include lots of parts of their banking business, not just making a loan, but getting deposits from them, uh, helping, helping them through generational issues, all those sorts of things. It's got to be because we focus on those things and focus on building a trusted business for the long term. That's why we set our remuneration arrangements in these way, because that, that works for us to build that strategic position in the industry. You also say in your statement that the board has a long-held view that remuneration which is leveraged towards short-term performance can create a disconnect between the individual's interests and the long-term interests of shareholders and other stakeholders, especially customers, including increasing the risk of poor culture within an organisation. You recall that? I do. Now, can you explain what you mean by a disconnect between the individual's interests and the long-term interests of, sh of uh, shareholders? Well, on, on any day, if there's an opportunity for someone to do something that makes a profit, for example, um, if, their, if their concern, uh, and if in fact the form of their remuneration forces them or leads them to think that the things to worry about is this month or this year's uh, revenue target or profit target, that's what they'll think about. What, what's the implications of this transaction for that objective? Um, if we're trying to build a relationship with customers that goes for their life or for a long time, uh, if we want them to come back to us for second and third pieces of business, um, if we want to build the trust in their communities and be seen to be, then we don't want them to do that. We want them to say, no, no, here's something that's better for you. And what about the board's view that remuneration leverage towards short-term performance can increase the risk of poor culture within the organisation. Can you explain that view? Well, as I say, I think in a way culture, is, culture gets used um, as the device, but in fact it's the describer of what, what's there. Yes. So if you are concerned about profits off an individual transaction, for example, that's not the culture that we want, mm. that doesn't reflect a behaviour, a set of behaviours that we think are going to be for the long-term betterment of the business and, and the stakeholder group. Uh, now, can I ask you about the short-term incentives that you offer for your executives? We've talked about the composition and their weighting within that composition, but your short-term incentive payments are made from a single bonus pool? They are. Uh, and that bonus pool is shared by all salaried employees of Bendigo, including the senior executives? Yes. And at the beginning of each financial year, the board sets parameters for the creation of that bonus pool? Yes. And what sorts of parameters are they? Well, we, uh, it comes as we, uh, as we, as and part of considering the targets, the budget, if you like, for the following, for the next 12 months. So uh, usually in June or July, we'll be presented with a, here's, what, here's a budget for the next 12 months. Uh, we'll set a target earnings number in that. Um, and as part of that, um, there will be uh, a budget, included in the budget will be an allowance for a bonus pool. Uh, 
And we also say that if that budget, if that target is exceeded, how much of that excess, as it were, uh, goes into a bonus pool, and then we cap it. So in this current year, um, I think if we achieve our target, the bonus pool will be of the order of 12 or $13 million, um, but it can never exceed $20 million. So even if we wildly outperform the target, the bonus pool won't be more than $20 million. And why do you have that cap on the size of the bonus pool, Mr Johansson? Well, if you're thinking about the long term and managing, banks are complicated businesses with lots and lots of moving parts. And if suddenly, um, and, and basically we make money by buying money and selling money at different prices, deposits and, and loans. Uh, if the numbers got a long way out of expectations, something unusual, something is happening in the base of the business that's worth paying attention to. Mm. So we don't want to stimulate that. Uh, that's why we cap it. Um, and that's, that's how we set it. Mm. Are you aware of other banks capping a bonus pool? <coughs> Not that I'm aware. Mm. And if the parameters that the board sets at the start of the year are satisfied, the board then has a discretion uh, to create the bonus pool. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and as I read your statement, the pool will only be created, I think this is what you've said today as well, if your performance at the bank exceeds rather than simply meets expectations. Is, no, that, but, is that right? About half the potential pool I see. is created, as it were, if we hit that target. Okay, so, so it's, it's not all, unless you hit it, unless you exceed it, you don't get anything. I see. There's a kind of margin in the middle. So about there. half is there? About half, a bit more than half, as I say, I think about 12 and a half, this year about 12 and a half of the 20 million potential uh, will be available if we reach our target. And having a portion that's only available if you exceed rather than meet your expectations. That's right, there is a portion that's yeah. only available in those circumstances. I, I understand you in your statement to be saying that you do that because you consider that short-term incentives should not be a payment to people for doing their job. That is the role of base remuneration. Yes. Is that your view? Yes. Uh, so how, how does that work with the 12.5 million pool that is well, there for... Uh, well, I mean, you know, to some degree it's arbitrary where you set the starting point and the numbers and you, you don't want... Um, you want it to come in gradually, as it were, as you're working through the year rather than there being a, a point at which suddenly it appears. And So you, you, it's really a process of man managing expectations and the, and the construction of the pool. So is there part of the pool that's um, available to people for doing their job as opposed to... Um, nothing, nothing is paid unless the pool is created. Mm. And the pool is created depending on financial performance... Yes. ..and also the exercise of the board's discretion. Yes. And, and what are the factors that influence the board, having met financial performance, to decide whether or not to create the pool? Well, we look at a, a range of measures um, to see, just to check that the pool has resulted from behaviours that are consistent with the risk appetite that we have. So in the, as I recollect in the paper that we considered for the creation of the pool, there were a number of metrics considered. We considered metrics like risk-weighted assets over total assets. We considered return on equity. We considered return on uh, risk-adjusted equity, risk-adjusted capital. So there was a, a range of measures uh, that we, we checked to make sure that the business was had achieved this pool, that achieved the results that created the pool, but it wasn't being manipulated to do so to distort the, the risk appetite that we, uh, we want. In your time at the bank, uh, has the board chosen not to create a bonus pool? 
Well, there'd been a couple of times in the last nine years where the pool was not created. Um, so the pool is, the creation of the pool is, is in the first instance at least a mechanistic exercise. What's the, what's the, at what, what's the, uh, res what are the earnings that have been achieved? What's the result of that? But then we apply our, um, but yeah, in the, la in the last nine years, I think twice no pool was created. Uh, I think only in one of those years did we get close to the maximum pool. Most of the time, the pool created has been of the order of 50 or 60 per cent. And what led to the decision not to create the pool on the two occasions that you've just our, described? Our earnings weren't good enough. I see. I see. And the size of the pool, when you said that on average it was 50 to 60 per cent, is the size of the pool again determined by earnings? Uh, well, as I say, that, that's set at the initial process. So the pool this year is 20 million. It was 20 million last year. That was the maximum size of the pool. The pool created last year was, I think, 12 and a half million. Mm. Based on earnings, Based is that on right? Earnings. Now, in your statement, you emphasise that the bonus pool is a product of the collective performance of the organisation rather than being associated with individual performance. Well, why do you consider that to be significant, Mr Johansson? Well, in the way I've described it, I hope you can see where it's really a profit sharing mm. mechanism. Um, it's, it's not an individual reward exercise, it's a profit sharing mechanism. Um, and if we're going to be profitable and live within the risk framework that we talk about, uh, if all those other things are going to be achieved that we're trying to work on to build the business, and, um, then people should share it. But it's a collective effort mm -hmm. and we are... We, we want to emphasise that everyone is a contributor and part of this process and, and, and responsible for it. Is there any limitation on the amount of award that can be paid out to an individual from the pool? Yes, we, we, set, we set the amount, uh, the maxima that they can get at the start of the year. And, and how do you set that? Is it the same amount or different amounts for different roles? Different, different amounts for different roles. Mm. So it, it varied the, the maximum uh, for, I'm not sure what the number is, category something or other, uh, it, it, of, of the salaried staff, it can vary between 20 or 15 or 10. The potential at the senior levels, you've seen the numbers there. Mm. And what happens when uh, an award exceeds, an award out of the pool exceeds $100,000? What happens then? It gets put into equity mm. and it's deferred. So the entirety is deferred? Of the amount over 100. I see. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. Yes. Now... Or is it... Yeah, sorry. I think that's right. <laughs> give, given the the strong views that Bendigo seems to have about the risks associated with remuneration that's weighted towards short-term performance. Um, can I ask you to explain why Bendigo offers its executives short-term variable remuneration at all? Well, as I say, I think it's seen as uh, if we've had a good year, um, uh, then it's appropriate that we share, share that some of the financial outcomes of that amongst other stakeholders. Because it is a profit sharing mechanism. Yeah. Now, can I turn to asking you about the long-term incentive component of your executive remuneration model? How many of your uh, employees are eligible to receive long-term incentive payments? Um, I think it's really only the senior management group. Mm. So quite a small number? Yeah. I don't hold me, 15, maybe 20. And you say in your statement that the bank offers long-term incentives to drive and reward long-term growth and sustained company value and to align the interests of participants with shareholders and other stakeholders. That's the objective. And who are the other stakeholders that you're referring to there, Mr Johansson? Uh, customers. 
And what do you mean then by uh, to align the interests of participants with shareholders and customers? Um, so some of our, uh, well, so we, our stakeholders are of course a very wide group of people. Um, uh, and uh, for the investor group, the people who give us their capital um, to look after, uh, for them, of course, it's important that we're able to, to generate good returns on, on the capital that they've invested with us. And it's become um, accepted uh, through the you know, really corporate, corporate world that incentive programs are an essential part of packages for senior executives. Um, but I think properly structured and properly managed, they can provide the, the mechanism to get employees to think about not just their job and their particular concerns, but also the interests of other stakeholders. Now, the way we structure our long-term incentive program, of course, for senior is not the only way we give them exposure to that, but it's one way and it's an important way. Hmm. So can I talk to you about how you do structure yeah. that? Each year, the employees who are eligible to receive long-term incentive payments get a certain number of performance rights. Yes. Uh, and at the end of a deferral period, those rights vest. Yes. But there are certain conditions that yeah. govern the vesting. Is that right? Yes. And the deferral period is four years for your managing director and three years for the other executives. Yes. And why does the managing director have a longer deferral period, Mr Johansson? We're trying to, we're trying to uh, have the managing director think about a longer perspective than... And that's, that's the job of the managing director. Mm. And if the performance rights vest, they're converted into shares... Yes. And I want to ask you some questions about the conditions that determine whether those performance rights vest. Now, you've exhibited a copy of the bank's most recent remuneration report to your statement, which is Exhibit 2, BAB 5039 Yes. And if we bring up 0043 and 0044 together, we can see a summary of the different conditions that determine whether performance rights vest. Um, now, if we could uh, blow up the table on the top left-hand side, we see that there are three sleeves they're referred to, uh, Mr Johansson. There are three performance hurdles, is that right? Yes. And they determine how many of the performance rights will vest? Yes. And there's also something called a service condition. What is the service condition? It means they have to be employed. I see. And the first performance hurdle is a customer hurdle? Yes. And that determines whether 30% of the performance rights vest? Yes. Uh, and the next two performance hurdles are an earnings per share or EPS hurdle and a total shareholder return hurdle. Yes. And together they determine whether the other 70% of the performance rights will vest. Yes. And 35% of that 70 depends on both hurdles and the remaining 35% depends solely on the total shareholder return hurdle. Yes. Uh, and that total shareholder return hurdle is uh, similar to the relative TSR hurdle used by other banks? Yes. Now, um, you introduced the customer hurdle, the one we see uh, in the first uh, column here, in 2016. Yes. And why did you do that? I described earlier our strategy. Our point of difference is that we want to, uh, we think the way to create a long-term value in our business is to be the most focused on customer outcomes. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, the, the most well, one of the most important what criteria then for uh, consistent with that strategy is what do customers think of us? And you measure that using the net promoter score? We do. Uh, and to satisfy that hurdle, your net promoter score over the deferral period has to be 20% greater 
than the median performance of your peer group of Australian banks. Is that right? Our, yes, it is. Our, our net promoter score is uh, much higher than other banks. So uh, a relative net promoter score wouldn't be much of a target. I see. As far as you're aware, Mr Johansson, do any other Australian banks currently have a customer-related performance hurdle in their long-term incentive schemes? Uh, I'm not sure about long-term. Um, mm. I know some are, are, are starting to introduce these things. Um, yeah, look, I couldn't tell you what specifically other plans are, but this the question of whether you can move away from purely shareholder return criteria for for long-term incentive programs is a fraught issue at the moment. Mm. Do, do you think that the introduction of the customer hurdle at your bank changed the way your executives behave? No, but it reflected what we were concentrating on. So it was appropriate that for this program we, we introduced it. Now, you decided to change the structure of your long-term incentives in September this year. Is that yeah, right? Yes. Uh, and could I ask that you look at BAB 5037 Now, this is a submission that was put to the board by the talent and reward and people and performance parts of the business at a meeting on the 4th of September. Yes. And we see from 0065 the submission recommended in the part towards the bottom there that the board approve a recommendation to modify the design of the long-term incentive grant in line with option two in this paper. Yes. Now, if we bring up the, the, these two pages, 0064 and 0065, we can see a summary of the existing scheme and the two options to change that scheme that you were considering. Uh, now, the options we see were put forward, we see this from the paragraph above market practice on the left. Yep. They were put forward to ensure that the plan continues to engage and motivate participants to create sustained company value and align their interests with shareholders. And this was taking into account the challenging financial environment for FY19. Yes. Was the board concerned that it would not be possible to meet the earnings per share hurdle? Um, uh, I think, I, well, it, certainly this year is a, a challenging year and uh, when we looked at the, at the budgets and things, there was a lot that, uh, a lot that was in that. So yeah, probably that was one of the considerations. Well, we see that the first option for change at 0065 was to retain the existing weighting between the customer measure and the two shareholder measures, but to make the earnings per share hurdle easier to meet. Yeah. And the second option was to remove the earnings per share hurdle entirely and adjust the weighting between customer and shareholder measures. Yes. Decreasing the amount of performance rights that depend on the total shareholder return hurdle from 70 to 65 per cent and increasing the amount that depend on the customer hurdle from 30 to 35 per cent. Yes. And that was the option that the board adopted. Yes. And why did the board adopt that option, Mr Johansson? Well, I think the, I've explain perhaps sufficiently why we're interested in the net promoter score, why yes. that's, we think, crucial and important. Um, you, long term you, is... You increase the reliance on it, though, by increasing the customer hurdle from 30 to 35 per cent. Yes. And that, that's what I'm interested in. So not only was it a significant component, um, you made it a larger component in September this year. It's become, for us, even more important that we focus on that those outcomes. And why is that? Because that's in, in the very competitive banking market that we now have, where uh, growth 
the availability of a sort of almost unlimited credit has stopped, um, it's becoming even more important that if we're to continue to build our business and grow our business and be able to invest in it, uh, that we ad attract more customers. So we want people to concentrate on customer outcomes. Tender that document, Commissioner. Submission to board meeting for September 18 concerning LTI performance hurdle modification, BAB 5037-004-0063, Exhibit 7.142. Have your shareholders tended to support your bank's approach to executive remuneration? Yes. Could I ask that you look at BAB... 5041-0001-0028. This is a report issued by ISS Governance in relation to Bendigo's 2018 annual general meeting. Yes. And ISS Governance is a proxy advisor firm. Yes. And proxy advisor firms uh, recommend how shareholders should vote on certain resolutions put in a, at an AGM. Is that they right? They do. They've, they've become a really important part of the process of uh, shareholder engagement um, very much. Mm. Could I ask you to look at 0029, where we see the recommendations made by ISS Governance... ISS Governance recommended a vote against a resolution approving a grant of performance rights and deferred shares to Ms Baker at this year's annual general meeting. Yes. And the report records uh, in the section underneath, nevertheless, in the second dot point, that one of the reasons for this recommendation was the increased weighting given to the customer hurdle in the long-term incentive plan. We see that the proxy advisor firm advised that this measure had no direct link to shareholder wealth outcomes. Yes. And that customer-centric measures should be considered and assessed as part of a banking executive's day job. Yes. Now, do you think it is right to say that the customer hurdle in your long-term incentive plan has no direct link to shareholder wealth outcomes? Well, no, because we think, we think that is crucial, as, I, as I've said, for the long-term growth and profitability of the business. And do you agree that customer-centric measures should only be assessed as a part of a banking executive's day job? Um, well, no, I, but I think that the, the day job, as it were, <laughs> includes uh, thinking about hopefully all parts of the remuneration package are working together to achieve common outcomes. The, the, share, the proxy advisors, of course, are employed by institutions um, uh, and it provides really a pretty rigorous way for institution, large numbers of institutions to get to grips with these questions when often they historically haven't been that interested in them. So it's, uh, it's an important process. But, but those, the people who pay the proxy advisors themselves are assessed on typically short-term financial outcomes. Mm -hmm. So it's no surprise that a fund manager is interested in short-term financial outcomes because we all, as investors through superannuation funds, are concerned about whether this, this six months our fund has done well or not. It's a, I think there's a kind of, you know, a dilemma in all this, that, but you need to balance, balance the different outcomes. But it's, this, re it's reducing some quite complex questions to binary outcomes, isn't it? That's that's and in so so in, in our case, um, maybe forty percent of our shares are held by institutions. Uh, maybe uh, and so sixty percent are held by retail shareholders, um, and of those institutions, a number of them hold shares as an index fund. and So there's a mix of objectives uh, in the institutional uh, market as well. 
Um, but this is a essential part of the process of discussing and ventilating those things. In your experience, do the views expressed by proxy advisers in reports such as this in relation to executive remuneration um, tend to align um, with achieving good customer outcomes? Um, <laughs> uh, not always. Do they align with the long-term sustainability of the bank? Uh, not on their own. In the submission that Bendigo provided the Commission following the interim report, the bank said that institutional shareholders and proxy advisers typically require executive remuneration to have a substantial weighting towards incentive-based pay that is directly exposed to financial performance and share price performance and criticise remuneration structures that do not do so. I think the report you just led us to shows that. Mm. And do you write to investors who take advice from particular proxy firms such as this ahead of annual general meetings uh, to provide a different point of view? We do. We have a we try and be, have a very kind of active engagement with shareholders in that period leading up to uh, the annual general meeting. Well, I'll tender the ISS governance report. ISS governance proxy analysis concerning Bendigo and Adelaide Bank for meeting October 18, BAB 5041-0001-0028, Exhibit 7.143. And can I take you now to a letter that you wrote ahead of this year's annual general meeting, which is Exhibit 16 to your statement, BAB 5039-0003-0001? Yes. Now, this is a letter that you wrote to a particular investment manager about the advice from the proxy advisor firm that I just took you to on the 24th of October this year. Is that right? It's yes. the second document yes. in that yes. exhibit. Yeah. And in this letter you set out the rationale for the board's decision to recommend each of the resolutions. Yes. Uh, if we turn to 0002. We see a bit lower than halfway down the page. Uh, your explanation of the rationale for the recommendation to approve the issue of deferred shares and performance rights to your new CEO. We see you said, in setting the new managing director's remuneration, the board determined that the managing director should have relatively lower levels of incentive-based pay and in doing so has sought to align senior executive pay with shareholders' interests by having a portion of base pay paid in equity we referred to it as deferred base pay or deferred shares. The recent focus on the importance of culture and the risks associated with incentive programs support this view. Yes. And further down, uh, you said in the paragraph starting the board, the board has also determined that it is appropriate for a component of the long-term incentive to include a measure, 35%, that is based on customer advocacy performance, which is particularly relevant for the banking industry, given the reputational issues driven by poor customer outcomes that have been exposed through the Financial Services Royal Commission. Yes. So this was advocacy on the part of the board in response to the advocacy from the proxy advisor firms yes. uh, ahead of this year's annual general meeting. Yes. Now, did the resolution in relation to the grant of performance rights and deferred shares to Ms Baker pass at it your did. recent ATM? It did. Uh, and what proportion of voting shareholders voted against it? Uh, I think we had about 200 million of our 500 million uh, shares voted. Um, and the problem, well, one of, I don't know it's a problem, but the, but the reality is that few of the retail shareholders actually vote. Mm. So of the 200 million uh, that voted, I think there were about 20% mm. that voted against this resolution. Mm. So it, it passed. 
your ASX announcement indicates 19.2 per cent voted against it. Right. And did the resolution in relation to the approval of your remuneration report pass? It did. And what proportion of your voting shareholders voted against that? Very few. Yes. Less than five, I think. Yes. Your ASX announcement indicates 4.4 per cent. I want to understand, Mr Johansson, do you have to work hard at Bendigo to convince institutional shareholders in particular to support your remuneration framework and decisions such as the one that we saw you writing about in the previous letter? Well, we are conscious that we are a bit different, um, but indeed that's, that's what we say we are. We, are, we, we think we, we, we play a different position in the, in the market. So it's not surprising that uh, our remuneration structure is different too. Um, we do work hard, um, but we work hard with all our stakeholder groups and shareholder groups uh, to try and let them see what we're, what we're doing. And all of that work takes place against the backdrop of the two strikes rule. Yes. And you may have heard me ask questions of other witnesses in this round of hearings about the two strikes rule. Uh, do you have any views on whether it would be desirable to modify the two strikes rule in any way? Uh, well, I, I think that what this example shows is that the two strikes rule uh, can mean that a relatively small proportion of the total shareholder group can have significant influence on the direction of the company. Uh, to, to, do, to, to run two strikes uh, would be a very disruptive, um, costly, and I'm, I, I just don't mean in dollar terms, but costly exercise for an organisation. And so where voting participation is relatively small, and I think we do quite well to get 40% of our votes, uh, our, share, our shares to be voted, um, it does mean that those institutional holders can have a a big influence. Mm. So do you think modifications ought to be made to address that problem? I, I do, but I'm also, my, my caution is that it has turned out to be a very effective way to have people focus on this stuff. Uh, so instead of just blithely assuming it away, people do now work hard on this stuff. So I'm... People, which people? People within the bank? Within companies. People? people who are trying to get the, the resolution Within passed. companies, uh, uh, engaging with shareholders, with proxy advisors, yes. reaching out to other shareholder groups who aren't uh, represented necessarily by proxy advisors, uh, finding new ways of, of contacting them, of engaging with them. Mm. Uh, I think we all do a lot more work on that, which is good. And I'm sure the two strikes rule has been very much part of that. Mm. So I think based on your evidence so far, Mr Johansson, the position is that um, there are a number of significant differences uh, between the executive remuneration model at your bank and the model at a number of other banks. Can I list these to see if I have them correct? Um, your bank defers a part of its executive's base remuneration. Yes. Uh, it has a lower proportion of short-term variable remuneration as opposed to fixed remuneration. Yes. Uh, the short-term variable remuneration is based on collective performance. Yes. And it's only paid, I just want to make sure I've understood this, it, is it only paid in the event of exceeding the bank's expectations or in the event of meeting expectations? Uh, part of it. Is, is paid Meet. on meeting and part, on, and part exceeding. on exceeding. And under your long-term incentive scheme, there's a customer performance hurdle that determines whether 35% of your performance rights vest for executives. Yes. Now, each of those is a feature of your bank's executive remuneration system um, that is different to other banks. Yes. And do you think that those differences in your model um, make it difficult for you to attract the right employees? Uh, we have a terrific group of people working for us. Um, uh, uh, we've been able to recruit 
continue to recruit people. Um, I'm sure there are some people who don't come to us as a result of looking at the, at the uh, packages that we offer. Um, and I'm sure there's some people who've left as a result of being able to be get, uh, different structures in different places. But uh, we have an outstanding group of executives. So do I take from that that you don't feel that it impedes your ability to get the right people running your bank? But the people who are interested in coming to us are those who probably see this as yes. being the right kind of Yes, I understand. Uh, do you think that the differences in your remuneration model make you a less competitive business? Uh, no, I th uh, it's not the remuneration model that uh, determines our competitiveness. And indeed, given that our strategy, our, uh, how we choose to compete is on service and trust, it actually complements that. And do you think that the differences in your remuneration model uh, diminish your returns to shareholders? Not, no, I, I think that that uh, our, our, the model, uh, because it works for that section of the business and for that section of the market, it enhances it. The, Which section of the business? Sorry, for the industry is what I meant. Yes. I'm, I'm not so, it, it, Not all the industry, not everybody wants to bank with a Bendigo bank. Some people want to bank with different sorts of organisations. Um, and indeed, we think that uh, one of the big problems we've got is that other models of competition have become very difficult as a result of the financial uh, factors that apply to us and, and to other regional banks. So the returns that are available to us, we think the way we run the business, our customer Set, uh, our, our focus on customer service uh, is the best way for us to achieve those outcomes. Do you think that your remuneration model has had an effect uh, on the conduct of the people who run your business? Yes. And at, within your witness statement, uh, you say that you consider that your approach to remuneration has assisted your bank in avoiding some of the issues that have affected other participants in the industry in recent times. What sort of issues are you referring to there, Mr Johansson? Uh, some of the uh, mis-selling um, sorts of issues that uh, I think we're now all familiar with. And why do you consider that it's assisted you to avoid those issues? Because we haven't provided incentives for people for the short-term outcomes to do, participate in those behaviours. Now, could I turn to asking you some questions about the way you remunerate your frontline staff? Sure. Uh, are you familiar with the recommendations made by Mr Sedgwick in his report? Yes. Uh, and did Bendigo adopt practices which were consistent with those recommendations in many respects long before that report was published? We did. When did your bank remove all sales-based incentives and commissions? Uh, we certainly, there was um, in 2004 or six, as I recollect, we, uh, we had a joint venture in a financial planning business that we ended up taking in-house um, and we at that time thought about a lot of these issues and removed commissions. So certainly since then um, uh, we haven't paid for frontline staff those sorts of, uh, those sorts of payments. So was it the... I, I don't remember that we ever, but certainly at Bendigo I, I can't remember that we ever paid. Yeah. Yes. So is it the case that sales-based incentives um, weren't prevalent uh, within Bendigo uh, at the time that you brought in this wealth component to your business? Yes. And then when the wealth business came in, you considered what to do with uh, sales-based incentives and commissions in that part of the business? Yes. 
uh, and you made the decision that in that wealth part of the business you would remove yes. sales-based commissions and incentives. Yes. Uh, and was that regarded at Bendigo as a significant decision? Uh, I don't think it was at the time particularly shocking. Mm. It was consistent with the way we'd run the business. But again, a very different approach um, to the approach of your peers. Apparently. Mm. You, you say in your statement that you're unable to express a view on whether that move away from sales-based incentives has reduced employee misconduct or conduct that falls below community standards and expectations because it's just so long ago that you did this. Is that right? Yes. I mean, we've had instances uh, that you look back on and think... But, um, but I think uh, we've done pretty well. Mm. Are you able to make any broader observations about whether you feel that Bendigo has historically been disadvantaged in some way uh, by not using sales-based incentives? Uh, I'm sure it's, it's uh, to some degree uh, determined the kind of business that we end up doing. I'm sure that's right. Do you think it's affected the motivation of your employees to serve your customers? Uh, no, they get, they, they get their uh, satisfaction um, from being uh, trusted and um, your customers, you know, feeling they're doing a good job. Would you consider making further changes, um, such as reducing variable incentives as a proportion of your overall remuneration? We, every year we, we go through this and think about what's the right mix and what's the... Every year we interrogate the, 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 the incentives and the pay systems through the organisation. Um, to some degree we're in a marketplace where um, I don't think it's an option really just to give up on the idea of any long-term incentive for senior executives. Um, so we... And, and people to some degree are prepared to uh, let us be unique, but they don't want us to be too different in some way. So we're, we're in a marketplace, so we need to, be, to, to fit within those broad parameters. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure we'll continue to, to check that the behaviours we're measuring and rewarding are the ones that are really the ones we want for the long-term growth of the business. The final topic that I want to ask you about, Mr Johansson, is the remuneration of mortgage brokers. Um, how important are mortgage brokers to your bank? Not very. Mm -hmm. What proportion of your loans come through mortgage bro brokers, do you know? Uh, it's, it's about seven. I, I did check how many, what we wrote last year. So I think in the last 12 months, mortgage brokers as such is, is less than 10%. Less than 10 per cent. Yeah. And when home loans come to your bank uh, through mortgage brokers, you remunerate those mortgage brokers in uh, the conventional way uh, of upfront and trail commissions, is that right? Yes. And uh, do you accept that the ASIC review into mortgage broker remuneration and the Sedgwick review uh, both found that there were conflicts of interest inherent in that existing model of remuneration for mortgage brokers? Yes, we've, we've never, it may be why we've got so few, but we've never participated in bonus schemes and some of those other uh, system or arrangements within the industry. And what about the conflicts inherent in the simple upfront and trail commission stru uh, structure? Uh, ASIC described two types of conflict the product strategy conflict, which flows from the incentive for brokers to earn greater commissions for getting a borrower to take out a larger loan, uh, and the lender choice conflict, which flows from the incentives that brokers have to favour lenders who pay higher rates of commission. Do you agree that both of those conflicts exist in the current model? They can, yes. Uh, and do you agree that changes need to be made to address those conflicts? Uh, yes. Uh, now, 
uh, the reforms recommended by the Productivity Commission in this area included banning the payment of trail commissions to mortgage brokers for all loans originated after the end of this year. Uh, what are Bendigo's views on that proposal? Can I uh, just, just take a minute to tell you how else we get loans yes. other than just through branches or through mortgage brokers? So the largest group of our loans come through our partner network, the community bank network. So I, almost a third of the loans last year came to us through our partners, local communities who own their own distribution. Um, we also get about a fifth of our loans from what are called mortgage managers who aren't brokers in the sense of simply writing loans with commission uh, up front and trail, but they provide, we effectively provide them um, a cost of funds, a line of funds, and they then uh, go and write mortgages with customers um, at a premium to that, but they take on for themselves the costs of fees, yes. uh, expenses, so we might provide a line at, say, three and a half, but the mortgage is written at four and a bit. The difference goes to the broker. So um, and we also have a... Uh, we've now invested in an online mortgage uh, system where if you're a complying person, you can get a, li a line, a, a loan, um, through using all sorts of data validation processes very quickly, um, uh, purely online. So there's a, there's a great range of sort ways that we source mortgages, as there is in the industry. Mm. Um, so uh, the mortgage, mortgage brokers have become the one, the thing everyone wants to talk about. They were originally the, uh, this disruptive force because they provided a way for customers to get access to help to negotiate through this financial system. But as a result of what happened in 2008, they've affected, as I think the Productivity Commission says, they've become part of the establishment. Um, and indeed, many of them are owned by the major banks. So, um, but 60% but or 55% or something of customers choose to use third parties rather than go direct. So it's crucial, I think, that we don't interfere with the ability of customers to choose how they want to interact with this system, that we don't end up with a fee structure that impedes different ways of uh, providing that access to customers that customers choose, and we don't interfere with other potential disruptive processes. So oh, that's a bit of a preamble. but. But if we're now trying to think about what are the problems with brokers as brokers, uh, it's important that the solutions we come up with don't interfere with the ability of other organisations to provide that service. Um, so in our community banks, they get rewarded by effectively a revenue share. So we share the revenue on an ongoing basis. We don't pay them upfront commissions, but what we're trying to do is to ensure that they build a long-term business where they look after clients that come back to them and come back to them. And so we do it by way of a revenue share. So I wouldn't want any solution that we impose for the problem of brokers to interfere with that sort of uh, arrangement. So, so but I, I think- Just, just to, pausing there just yeah. for a moment, Dr. Jo uh, Mr. Johansson, do I take from that answer that uh, Bendigo has found a number of ways to bring in home loan business other than through its branch network. Um, you've talked about online measures, you've talked about through uh, community uh, partnerships, um, an, a number of measures that are different to the mortgage broker channel. Yes. And where the people you are dealing with are not remunerated on a commission basis. Yes. With the conflicts that flow from remuneration on a on a commission basis. But I think, and if I can say, I think the that interesting paper on conflicts in the 
in the uh, mm. um, that the co the, the commission, commission has available mm. shows the difficulty of actually structuring this in ways that achieves what I've said of the objectives. One is don't interfere with people's ability to choose the way they want to engage. Don't interfere with the capacity of the system to continue to innovate and cut costs and those things, but deal with conflicts adequately. I mean, that shows how difficult it is. So I think... Um, uh, um, so I, the idea of an upfront commission, even a, a volume-based commission, if it's properly disclosed, if it's clear um, to the customer what the implications of that are for their loan, um, uh, if the responsibility of the person who's getting the commission is clear, who are they working for? Uh, uh, and then I think that addresses a lot of those issues. Who do you think they work for? Well, I'm clear. Who do you think they should work for? I'm clear they work for the customer. Yes. Otherwise, why would the customer go for them? Um, I'm, I must say, I, in the thinking about all this, I am surprised that there's any question about that. And I'm surprised that the role of their responsibilities seem to be somewhat in question. Somewhat in question. Whilst an upfront commission remains that is linked to the size of the loan, there is an inherent conflict, is there not? Uh, well, there could be, though of course the size of the loan in part will reflect the amount of care and um, uh, the uh, your complexity possibly. Simply track it, simply locking on size is it, it can be a problem. But does it not incentivise a broker um, to press the customer for a larger loan because that will earn the broker a larger upfront commission? It could, yeah. Uh, and I had we had started this discussion uh, uh, with a question that I asked about trail commissions uh, and the reforms suggested by the Productivity Commission which included banning trail commissions, and I had asked you what Bendigo's position on that proposal was. Well, I'm concerned that a banning of trails doesn't catch what I think of those... It doesn't catch any of the other distribution systems that I described. Is that a reason to keep trail commissions? Uh, if, it, if a result of banning trails, we force customers only to deal through banks and bank branches, I think that would be a very bad outcome. Why would that be the result of banning a trail commission? It may not be the result, but I'm, uh, I'm you know, when you go, do we ban it entirely? Mm. Let's not have those other extreme outcomes. Well, what do you see as the value that a customer gets in exchange for the trail commission? Uh, well, it, it could only be if the customer... Um, and the problem at the moment is I think the customers are... Large, even though there might be some formal disclosure system, uh, the customer is unaware that trails are paid mm. and the amounts are paid. Mm. Um, perhaps there ought to be an, a requirement that if a, if a loan has a trail connected to it, the customer is made aware of it. Uh, maybe, the, maybe the advisor needs to do something in re, uh, actually in relation to that. Yes, I, I'm, maybe they do. I don't, have a, I don't have an answer. I'm just, I'm just... Brokers in their current form and third par other third-party distribution mechanisms have become an essential part of the financial system in Australia. And that's largely as a result of customer choice. You wouldn't want to impede customers uh, being able to choose different systems of, of getting access to lending. Well, is it a result of customer choice, Mr Johansson? The Productivity Commission said that trail commissions were most likely a traditional form of remuneration common in the 1990s when brokers emerged as this disruptive force that you've described 
which has simply persisted long after it has been found to be detrimental to consumers in other financial product markets. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm please, I'm not defending trails to brokers, um, but, I'm, but, it, but the package for brokers in their current form have become, as I say, an essential part of the distribution network for a lot of players in this market. Well, why could they not be replaced with a fixed fee, Mr Johansson? Uh, uh, they could be if it were um, fully recompensing the broker, um, if it were done in a way that ensured that customers still get access to the advice and help they want. Mm -hmm. But I'm I, I heard the evidence of uh, Mr Elliott, who was talking about um, let's not uh, let's not just keep advice or help through this system only to the very large borrowers. Yes, I, I understand. Uh, but the fixed fee, if a fixed fee was uh, used to replace the commission structure, do you have a view on whether that um, would more appropriately be paid by the lender or by the borrower. Uh, I think it should be. I think it should be apparent to the borrower that the amount is being paid and its impact on the loan. So, I, I, and I think the proposed the suggestion that should we effectively add to the amount of the loan the commission, so all those things are transparent. That could work, but it, but it. But in some way, uh, for a bank, uh, using a broker means it doesn't have to invest in a, in a branch network, for example. So it's a bit unfair that all the costs of it are loaded to the borrower, where the bank's effectively saving money. Well, you found plenty of ways at Bendigo to bring in home loans other than through your branch network or through brokers. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a good network. Yes. I have no further questions, Commissioner. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Yes. Uh, no questions, Commissioner. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Johansson. You may step down. Ms. Hall. Commissioner, I see the time. Yes. 2 p.m. Thank you, Commissioner. 2 p.m.